Hello everyone and welcome to CyberMix presentation in collaboration with NCWIT Aspire IT on social engineering and number system. We can't wait to introduce you to these topics in cybersecurity. Thank you so much for joining. Hi everyone. My name is Aditi and I'm an information systems major at the University of Texas at San Antonio. I'm involved with cyberweek.org as their marketing team lead and I'm involved in two other organizations. I'm very passionate about encouraging more girls to join STEM fields so that we can close the gender gap. Hello everyone, I'm Marie Fumetta and I'm going to be a right as high school junior in New Jersey. I'm also the marketing team lead at cyberweek.org, and I'm also part of other organizations. Essentially, I'm super passionate about the intersection of cybersecurity and advocating for gender equality, especially in STEM fields. So let's dive into our lesson for today. First, we'll be talking about social engineering. So I want you to think of three words that come to mind when talking about social engineering. And keep in mind, all ideas are good. We just want to get your brains thinking about the topic that we'll be discussing. Once you're ready, we'll move on. So now that you've had some time to think about what social engineering is, let me tell you the definition. Social engineering can be described as the psychological manipulation of people that leads them to revealing confidential or personal information, and that can lead them to perform actions unknowingly. So in other words, actions that people take that make you reveal information or download harmful malware to your computer. Some forms of social engineering include phishing. This is a type of social engineering in which people can send you an email to gain personal information and they can be pretend to be you. Another example of social engineering is called pretexting. And engineers in pretexting create a fabricated scenario to gain the victim's personal information. Pretexting relies on trust with the victim. Another form of social engineering is called baiting. And here, attackers promise an item in exchange for login credentials or other confidential information. And lastly, quid pro quo. Like baiting, this form of social engineering tells the user about a benefit in the form of a service. Recent cases have people pretending to be from the Social Security Administration. All of these forms of social engineering are extremely dangerous. We'll go over how to protect yourself from threats. So you might be asking yourself, what does social engineering generally look like? I mean, these include messages to your emails, which often contain links or downloads that will cause harm to your computers. They'll often use a story to grab your attention or contain multiple grammar mistakes. And by stories, we mean something that you might be interested in. They might notice that you're really interested in gaming or perhaps stocks and try to send you investing tips. And examples of social engineering include pretending your close friend is hurt, asking you to donate to a nonprofit, using a legitimate looking company name, or telling you that you've won something. So be careful and watch out for these emails and carefully verify that these are from the trusted source. So over here, you will see an example of phishing. This is an email. And you can see that there is multiple grammar and spelling mistakes, as well as the sender is saying to your customer instead of calling you by your name. All of these are red flags, as well as the file download. The file over here is clearly not something that you should download, especially if it's coming from someone you don't know. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that all emails with files are phishing emails. There's also a form of phishing called vishing, which is essentially phishing over the phone. So using your name and date of birth, someone pretending to be from a company will try to get your login credentials or any other information as well, using what they already know from someplace like social media. 
mind that this wishing is actually spelled V-I-S-H-I-N-G, as in like wish, but fishing. So now that you know what social engineering is and how it looks like, we want to go over things that you should do to prevent yourself or precautions to take. So if you get an email that looks like social engineering, Keep in mind that clicking any links will increase the chance of harm you do to your computer. So stay away from any links and to be safe, don't click anything. Also don't reply. This will let the sender know that the email is live and that they're actually reaching a potential person. Opening the email won't do anything, but just make sure to steer clear of clicking anything or replying. Also double check with the company to make sure that the email is legitimate. Sometimes the company does send incorrect emails. So it's always good to you know, give them a call and just check. And most importantly, don't panic. This happens to hundreds of people. And when you panic, you may end up making the incorrect decision. So if you get an email that looks like a scam, keep calm and try to figure your way out of the situation. So to verify the source of an email, as we have suggested previously, you can hover your mouse over to the display of uh, the name of the sender. Their email address will pop up and you will be able to tell whether they are legitimate or not. You can also inspect the email addresses to tell whether or not some numbers or letters are being substituted. Okay, enough talk, let's play. Now we're gonna play a game that's gonna help you better spot forms of social engineering. So on the following slides, there's going to be two email addresses. So using what you know about phishing, baiting, and the other forms that we discussed, check whether or not each email address is legitimate. We, we're gonna set a timer for about 10 seconds and try to spot if you can tell the difference between the two emails. So the first email and the second email, which one do you think is the right one? You got it, Aditi. How about you reveal the answer? Okay, so the correct one is the first one college at fas.harvard.edu. The second one is unfortunately the wrong one because you can see that Harvard is not spelt correctly. And the .edu is actually edv. Okay, let's try got the one. If you got that one, nice job. Sorry, Aditi, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Let's try the next one now. All right, ready, go. Try to find out which one is uh, legit. Okay, what do you think, Farisha? Which one do you think is right? Ooh, I think the first one is right yet again. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the I in the second one is actually substituted for an L. Phishing emails will often do this, you know, they'll substitute letters that look extremely similar and hope that people like you don't notice, but you're smart and you did notice a nice job on that. Let's try another one. This one is a little bit trickier. All right, let's check. Did you get this one right? It's the first one, and this is kind of hard, as I was saying before, because you can tell the Google spelt is actually spelled wrong. It says g o q g l e dot com. Well, okay then. I hope you guys got all of them right, and if not, now you know some tricks and um, that uh, scam email senders use. Okay, so let's keep going. Why is social engineering prevention important and why should you care? Divulging your personal information can cause your account to be used in, a danger, in dangerous ways. Identity theft can occur and your personal information can also be leaked to dangerous people and websites. Your bank account could be used by other people if you have your bank statements sent to your email. If you're a business owner, for example, people can get a hold of your bank accounts, shipping accounts, and so many other personal information. So it is important um, to 
make sure that you're preventing your personal information because there's also money on the line. There have been previous cases where people have lost as much as $2.3 million, all just because they didn't notice that they were being scammed. Social engineers with your personal information can also target your younger family members and also get a hold of your close friend's personal information. So by not protecting your own personal information, you can always be putting into threat the people that you surround yourself with. So here's a fun fact on passwords. We hate them, but we also love them. So how are passwords related to our family and friends? While people do hate passwords because of how often we have to change them and their difficulty to memorize, studies show that some people are actually emotionally connected with their passwords. For example, a woman realized that her entire family's passwords were connected with her sister's name. That's very dangerous because if one person knows your sister's name, or her name is out there on the internet, someone could guess your password, someone that's not supposed to know your password. So while passwords are tedious, they keep you safe and for some people have an emotional connection, but you should always use a good password to keep yourself safe and never use your family or friends' names in them. Okay, so I know we've been giving out some depressing yet very informative um, facts. So Let's play another game. On the following slides, we will be sharing some scenarios in which you must decide whether they are dangerous or not. Okay, so let's get started. You have a close friend in Facebook. She sends you a poll that encourages you to put down some information like your favorite color, your horoscope, your favorite movie, et cetera. So what do you think? Is this dangerous? Okay, Dee Dee, what do you think? I think this is dangerous. That's right. Poll gatherers could use this information to try and guess your Facebook password as well as other confidential information. And perhaps you didn't use your horoscope for your Facebook password, but if you used it for your bank account, that's just as worse. Okay, let's try another example. You get a pop-up when you go to visit a website claiming that you're one of the five winners that have the five billion search from Google, okay, and that you have to click a link to receive your prize. Now think about what we talked about, phishing links. What do you think? Is this dangerous? If you were thinking yes, that's right. Never click links until you are absolutely sure that they are legit whether they're an email or a web search or a pop-up. Melissa's people can use links to get access to your personal information. Okay, then that brings us to the end of our social engineering aspect, passing it on to Aditi to introduce your next topic. Awesome, thank you, Varisha. So I hope you guys really enjoyed the social engineering topics and maybe if you didn't know something before, now you know. All right, so let's move on to our next topic, which is number systems. So do you guys know what number systems are? Well, they're a way to express values numerically. And number systems are really helpful in computer science and cybersecurity because computers rely on number systems to operate. So do you guys know of any examples of number systems? Think about the language of computers. You might have come to mind is called what might have come to mind is called binary and binary is called the language of computers and the most common number system that we encounter is the decimal number system. That's where the digits zero through nine are and some of the other examples of number system we have are binary octal hexadecimal and base 64. Okay, that's a lot, <laughs> but let's just focus on a couple of them today and don't worry we'll go over them all too. Okay then, so just like any other huge topic with a lot of information, we wanted to introduce some vocabulary first. Here are just some words such as base, uh, which is the number of characters or digits used to represent uh, quantities in that number system. So binary, there's only, um, it's also known as base two because there's only two digits, zero and one. 
There are multiple other examples. There's also most significant bit and least significant bit or digit, which is just in a huge a number. The, first, the least significant bit is the one to the the rightmost, and the most significant is the leftmost. Um, this is just for you for your reference. Um, and let's keep going. Okay. Let's talk about the first decimal number system. Um, this system is also called the Arabic number system, and it's what we use to do our everyday mathematical computations. So the numbers are in base 10, and they consist of the digits 0 through 9. Mm -hmm. And now let's try an example. So it's super important that you know how to convert using this method because it's especially important in the number system. So you take a number, any number, for the sake of this example, we've taken 1,125. And this number is in um, the decimal number system. So what you do is you take the radix um, to the index power and multiply by the digit. So that's really just fancy language for saying our base is base 10, which is the decimal number system. So our radix is 10, and then we multiply it to the index power. So five is at index zero, two is at index one, um, the first one is at index two, and the, um, the second one is at index three. And the reason why I said first and second is because we usually go from right to left in numbers for like the bases. And then you multiply by the actual value. So that's how the number 1,125 comes to mind. Okay, oops, so one too many slides ahead. So if you have any questions, try to go over what we've just done and you'll figure it out. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so we just learned about the decimal number system, which is what we're all familiar with. Now we're gonna be talking about the binary number system. So in math and digital electronics, a binary number is a number expressed in the base two. This is the most simplistic number system. And it only consists of two digits, which are called bits. And these two digits that we call bits are zero and one. So binary is the language of computers because it expresses the command that the computer needs to follow. So what we see is not what the computer uses to do the behind the scenes stuff. So we've been going on and on about why we think these number systems are important, but take just a few minutes to really understand and develop your own answer as to why you think binary is important. Well, we personally think binary is super important for data encryption as well, which is basically trying to take um, just general text and encrypting it and basically changing its form so that it's harder to reveal what the actual information stands for. And binary is also super important for just like learning how computers work in general. Everything in the digital world is controlled by bits, zeros and ones, whether it's pictures, videos, movies, files, everything, zeros and ones. So here's just this chart um, that shows conversions from the base 10, the decimal number system, to base to the binary number system. And try um, to pick any number and see if you can convert to binary yourself. Now we'll do an example to perhaps help your be gain better understanding on how to do it. So from binary to decimal, it doesn't matter whether the number is an integer or a fraction, the way you do it is the same. You basically multiply the number with the base of the power of the index. And we've gone over what index is. In this example, we have the number 1,101,011. And each of the num point um, 001101. And it's an incredibly huge number. But all you have to do is identify the indices. So any number to the left of the decimal point is positive index. And any number to the right of the decimal point is negative index. You multiply the actual value by um, of the number, for example, in index positive six, you take two to the six times one, and you just keep repeating the same method to convert from the binary number to the decimal number. 
I know it's a handful, but the same process is also, like we mentioned before, regardless of whether it's an integer, decimal, or fraction. So in this case, um, what we do to convert 384, which is the decimal number, it, to binary, we will keep dividing it by two. And um, basically the answer goes in reverse. So 384 divided by two is 192, but that zero becomes the least significant bit. And you keep doing that. And as you can see, the very last time you do it, you result in a one and the one eventually becomes the most significant bit. So uh, short and sweet, you keep dividing the decimal integer by two and write the remainder starting from the least significant bit or digit and repeat until you have a remainder of zero. Okay, let's keep going with another uh, number system. Awesome. So this number system is called octal and it's not used frequently, but it's a convenient representation of binary numbers. And the octal number system or uses base eight, the digits zero through seven. And it's greater if it has greater efficiency, which means that it can run faster. And this is important in computers with lower specifications. All right. And then the hexadecimal decimal number system is um, used because it provides a more efficient representation of binary. So the hex system is base 16 and it has digits zero through nine and letters A through F. So it can allow for more efficiency than octal. So hexadecimal is even more efficient. Mm -hmm. And here's another chart for um, hexadecimal, octal, and binary conversions. Um, this is helpful if you had to do these by hand, but we're just letting you know like how cool it is that you can transfer everything. Intimidating, right? Kind of, well, don't worry about it. Um, all these computer engineers and cybersecurity professionals have these charts at your disposal. And eventually what you'll be working with is a lot more complicated than this and probably won't have to do these by hand, but to really understand computer science, it's always good to know the foundations. Okay, so let's do some more examples. Let's try to convert from octal to decimal. Same thing, same method. We have a number 65.21, but this is an octal. So what we do is we label our indices, just like we had mentioned, and multiply everything. So for example, 65. So you take the six and you multiply it um, by eight to the power of one because one is the index, eight is the radix. And you keep going and going until you find out your answer. And just another example from binary to octal. So this time you have a big binary number and you're trying to convert it into octal. Now here's something um, to think about when you're converting from binary to octal, we take three bits at a time. And that's just how to do it. So you'll group three, um, you'll make groups of three. So you'll have three ones and that is a seventh. You'll group um, zero, one, zero, and that results into a two and zero, zero, one, and that results to a one. And the reason why um, we take it into groups of three is because uh, two to the power of three is eight. So that's just a little gimmick that computer engineers came up with. Um, hex to binary, similar process. You take each number, um, each hexadecimal number, and convert it to its binary um, equivalent. So E in binary is 1110. And so you do that for each single digit. And there's no um, equivalent for the decimal point. So you just put it there to divide the two numbers. Okay. So here are just some additional resources. Feel free to check them out. And there are tons more on the internet. If you have any questions, I'm sure there's a lot of videos online that can explain how to do it. But feel free to contact cyberweek.org um, or leave a message on our website and we'll be sure to get back to you um, with um, solutions to all of your questions. We thank you for your time and passing it on to Aditi to let you know about one final opportunity. Yes, thank you so much, Parisha. So I hope you guys enjoyed our mini lesson today and I have some exciting news for you. 
If you are interested in cybersecurity, I think this would be the perfect opportunity for you guys to join us on July, July 19th to July 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern time for a free virtual week of cybersecurity curriculum. So cyberweek.org is offering this for anyone from K to 12, and we would love for you guys to join. So please do join us, and we look forward to seeing you there. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.